Catus Maximus here. This time with a review of a Black and Decker 7150, which is a eclectic generation of tools from them. I'm not exactly sure when they date from. People who go to junk store, junk stores or garage sales, have probably seen the old metal gearbox, usually orange, but they can be like a real dark green or a tan. Various colors of their home utility drills, which is an extension of the home utility drills that they released in the 1920s. Black and Decker's been around for a century. Sold a million drills by 1930. They invented the pistol grip style drill. They sold the beans out of them over the last century, and there has been a bunch of different models. They, for a while, back in the 70s and 80s, I mean, they had many uh, heavy duty, extra heavy duty professional grade stuff, but that's obviously a lot less common than their home utility stuff. So, this is like an improved version of those old metal gearbox ones. I've seen multi a couple different versions of these, but they are particularly uncommon. And this happens to be a 3.5 amp, 1000 RPM drill, which is a slightly different. It's like a carpenter's drill, but like a home, ut a home utility grade or a homeowner's grade of a carpenter's drill. But being a carpenter's drill, it's still better than those old orange gearbox ones. Those things were really terrible. The orange gearbox ones had all sleeve bearings. They had only one rolling bearing. That was a thrust bearing. These I've seen before, but without any labels. And I've been waiting to find one in decent condition to make a video about. Some of these did have uh, silver painted gearboxes. I lucked out and got one of the slightly earlier ones with a polished gearbox. Many of them had the really cheesy chucks. You can tell uh, this is a better chuck because it, it's a Jacobs Multicraft, which is a... Homo, it's one of their lesser grades, but at least this one is billet steel collar, billet steel body. And I think these, this model of drill, this happens to be 7150, has only, was probably only made for just a few short years. Because they're not very common. I mean, the most distinctive thing is the fact that you can notice that it has a split gearbox here. And there's our fasteners. But the later ones, the chucks, you could tell because they had a silver collar. And a black sleeve and those were really terrible because that was just a sheet metal sleeve so at least this is one of the the better ones one of the things that caught my attention was seeing this right here that's the distinctive shape that little cup that's pressed in there on a through hole and in this case you can see it because there is a through hole uh that's a needle bearing and actually i looked it up or used a magnifying glass that's a torrington brand american brand made in the usa needle bearing i don't believe this drill is all ball needle bearing but I can tell that there's at least one right there, which already makes it have more rolling bearings than any of those home utility grade ones. The other thing is, the home utility ones had like a reverse switch on the back. This one's kind of interesting because it's right here. It's actually like, you know, most times you're going to be using this in a forward direction. So that's pushing it forward, makes it rotate in the forward direction, pulling it back makes it rotate in the reverse. That actually makes a lot of sense because it's a push to go forward. Most times when you're using it, that's the natural tendency for your thumb to already be on that. It's a little uncomfortable because you have this nub here, uh, and that's when they really start going to the matchstick style. Um, but it's really not bad. You're not going to accidentally reverse it. This style of variable speed trigger is actually very common in a wide variety of drills, but this reverse switch makes it proprietary. These little knobs are stops so that you can just pull the trigger all the way or until it stops and maybe run at a lower speed if you're using a sanding disc. But these little variable speed triggers are notorious for failing. And this one doesn't really vary very much anymore. We have to pull it just a huge amount to even get it to engage. As soon as it warms up, it like freaks out and basically turns into a two-speed like medium high and then full. It actually sounds pretty nice. And some people may have been familiar with the Black & Decker Best series. I have a router. See, it, they had this distinctive orange color and they had this logo Best. They also had drills and other tools, and what these were were better than their home utility, but not their heavy duty. They were like, kind of like a gap 
bridging, you know, in between uh, grade of tool. And this is different from the best series. Doing some research, this logo stopped being used in uh, 83, so that will date this tool sometime between 63 and 83. Uh, being all the plastic and the variable speed, it's somewhere in the 70s or the early 80s. Anyway, it actually seems pretty decent, and it's just a really one of the strikingly rare models. Now, like I said, I've seen this body style before, but they never had the stickers on them. And we can see why this one, I mean, has barely been used. This thing is in excellent condition. And still, the stick, the glue is just failing on these stickers, and they're barely staying on here. I mean, just barely. And this one's all crumpled up anyway. But we can see 1,000 RPM, 7150, 3.5 amps. It's advertising a whopping quarter horsepower. UL listed. Uh, and this is a Type A. And is this a... Uh, it is a Towson, Maryland, not a Hampstead. Hampstead, excuse me. So, pretty cool. Anyway, now that we have one of these uncommon tools, I'll have to say that it's actually a hassle to deal with servicing one of these. And you might think, oh, well, we have three screws, so this is just a split gear case. We can remove the three screws, and it's like, there's like a lip, and then you would think that there's a lip, and that's what's holding the gear case onto the plastic body is you just put the two halves together and they kind of connect. But no, this is a surprisingly expensive design. A design like this today would cost quite a bit of money. And you'll see in a minute, but this is actually has all cast internals, which is really good for alignment, but it's a hassle to try to take it apart. Why? Because this whole back, this is like a plastic sleeve that you have to slide off. So you actually have to take everything apart. It just is dated. It does have all flathead screws. And yeah, I'm using a older style uh, Stanley 100 Plus, which actually apparently they still sell for some outrageous amount of money. $100 a set. And apparently still not as good as the old 100 Pluses. But figured I'd use an appropriate... Uh, era screwdriver to work on this tool we do have on this lower portion here it's not just threaded into the plastic we do have little nuts so it is nut and bolt style uh, which is nice to see so the first thing we have to do here is attempt to get this whole deal apart here which is a bit of an effort already seeing things that i find interesting that i like first we have you can just say that's fail on brand wiring 105 degrees celsius that's over 200 degrees so that is actually premium wire we can see uh, there's the wire but there's an extra layer insulation where it goes back up you can see the back end of the cast internal so it's really strange that this is a all metal drill with a plastic over handle we can see that the power cord, oddly enough, comes in and is just uses wire nuts to connect it. But what we have to do is disconnect one of these wire nuts and the other wire from the back of the trigger, which is a spring connector, which is real fun to deal with, in order to pull this whole back housing off. And that's just to change the brushes. Actually, there's four wires we have to disconnect because it's a reversing drill. So, just want to kind of remember what we got here. Red's on the left, red and black, and the other one's white. And, of course, the one that was uh, twisted is easy to tell. Of course, the fun with these spring connectors is you've got to get a pick that's super, super tiny. And try to get it down in there, figure out what side the little spring-loaded catches on in order to release the wire. Those things, these things are always fun. And they never went away. Modern drills used to do the same thing. Now this is like a standard shape and design of trigger. It's just that they have this special 
reverse lever riveted onto it. I suppose if the trigger totally failed that uh, you could replace it with another one and just not have a reverse. Looking at this we can see 4 amps at 125 volts so it's overrated but not by very much. Now that we've gone through that adventure so you, have, you can take out these two screws which are what's holding this I assume to be Bakelite. I'm not sure what material it is. These two flathead screws here and we can slide this off. So you actually have to unplug the wires in order to remove the housing and it's just like what on earth is going on here with the why why they designed it like this I mean it's just expensive and uh, that's why I mean it's like a definitely a better than the just the standard home utility drills but still isn't you know one of the black and decker heavy duty uh, units so we can see that well maybe you can't we can still see that it appears to be a sleeve bearing just an oil light bronze sleeve bearing for the back of the motor we can also see that it has wide contacts instead of the narrow ones which means the motor runs a slightly slower RPM. It also means that it has less uh, power density. So it's just not good. It's a cheaper motor because you have less wire and less contacts, but it just doesn't develop quite as much power. It is using uh, folded contacts on there for the commutator, which isn't great. But besides that, it's still uh, kind of interesting how they have this whole thing set up like this with this whole cast internal section just don't really understand you know why they would have done that it does have a steel fan but still it's just it's an expensive design for not being a quote-unquote heavy-duty version of the drill and we can now see that the two halves are held together via a variety of fasteners we've got one two three four five six seven eight fasteners holding this thing together fortunately all the screws are the same length so you don't have to worry about keeping track of uh, where they all go and you just slowly work this housing off definitely some old grease in there I mean you can tell this I mean the kind of the oddball expense of this just because you have to have these two rather precision cast you know halves I mean, there's a lot of complication in this casting here. There's all sorts of thin profiles, which means the molds and everything have to be uh, really good. You have this whole surface, which has to be pretty flat. And you have all these screw holes that you have to drill into it. It's just, it's just an oddball kind of uh, expense here. Anyway, of course, the brushes want to you know eject themselves out whoop you can barely see that there it is held in by these little notches another thing that it does not exist in the home utility grade versions is we can see that the first stage here is helical cut which explains why the gears were sounding a little bit nicer um they're straight cut on the home utility grade so that's another difference is at least the first stage is helical cut but You can see the field is just held in by these plastic kind of isolators. We can see the unfortunate sleeve bearing there. It appears to also be a sleeve bearing up in the front, but we'll take a quick look on that. So there's our sleeve bearing in the back. We have a little wave washer that acts as a spring. And a couple other little like little spacers. This certainly looked like one of those uh, oil light bearings because it had kind of the same shape but in this oil light bearing you can see it's actually keyed so it can't get stuck and spin but as I was looking at this front bearing you can see the little needles in there so the front bearing on the motor is a needle bearing 
and the rear bearing is an oil light bearing uh, or a sleeve bearing. So I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. This is already proving to be a lot better than the uh, old ones were. Now here's our main spindle. And so they have a steel plate in the back. What's taking the thrust is literally this little bearing ball. That's the thrust bearing. When you're pr pressing and drilling, it's literally just on a, uh, a single little bearing ball, which is actually, I mean, it can wear out and sink in over time, but it's extremely low friction when you have just a single little bearing ball. The back of the spindle here is unfortunately a also an oil light bearing. So that's a sleeve bearing on the back of the spindle. And the front of the spindle I'm sure is a sleeve bearing too because we have this big cutout or this big notch which doesn't exist on or maybe actually they do have a notch on that needle bearing. Should have pulled the chuck off. Uh, I'm having a hard time telling if this is also a needle bearing that's kind of in a package that's like a sleeve bearing like on the front of the motor or if it really um, is a sleeve bearing. It could easily be sleeve because the spindle runs at just so much lower of an RPM. And the last thing about this is we can see the two little nuts that are integrated for the back, the case screws. But it's this idler gear. I mean, I know that's a needle bearing in front because you can read the part number on it. But on the back, you can also see a through hole. And I don't know if that's also a needle or a sleeve bearing. It's kind of hard to see. But the other thing is you can see that there's a bearing pushed in through that way. And a bearing pushed in through this way. So you're wondering, well, if that's a solid cast housing, there's obviously not enough space in there to, like, push it back and forth to uh, attempt to, you know, rock it in there. You're wondering how the heck they even got that gear in there. And to tell you the truth, I mean, if you look, this is a solid casting, solid casting, bearings on both sides, and there's not enough space for the gear to slide back and forth. It means the only way they got this together was by pushing in the pin through this hole in the back is how this was gear was installed so i don't think you'll ever be removing the gear i'm going to see if i can use a magnet to maybe that pin is actually just a loose fit and then i can just magnet it out so no definitely not magneting that pin out it's press fit into the gear so the only way to service that gear is you actually whoop there goes my two little nuts I was about to say there is a straight shot here, but you're going to have to get like a pretty long punch. It is relatively parallel to the front of the gear case. So the, how you service that is you actually have to press and push that pin out through the front, front which is going to push out that uh, little front needle bearing. Well, the chuck wasn't on particularly tight, so I was able just to wrap it in this rag and impact it off with my... Just holding it in my hand and I'm glad I did open that up so the front primary spindle bearing is another needle bearing that's been inserted into a little metal housing that's like the uh, sleeve bearings and the reason they have this kind of shape is so that they can rock and tilt just a little bit so they can in basically achieve uh, perfect alignment uh, kind of naturally just by the ang the by the shaft that goes through it it's able to instead of having to have absolutely perfect alignment inside the casting they can use this this slight curvatures there so it can just rock back and forth but I'm actually surprised that there's a needle bearing for the primary on the end of the spindle so I'm glad I took that apart so and oddly enough, the three the three needle bearings that this drill has are all on the front. One on the front of the motor, 
one on the front side of the idler gear and one on the front of the spindle and the three back bearings are all sleeve bearings so kind of an interesting design choice there but that alone makes it like this is a uh, odd drill is like really tuned really specially engineered to be ex like right in between their orange body home utility grade tools and their professional tools which would be all ball needle bearing and have like either you know would have more normal gearboxes that screw onto the front of a housing whether that's plastic or cast aluminum so this black and decker carpenter's drill is just kind of a, an interesting oddball tool and i can understand why they're pretty rare and why i just have not run into them uh except for like once or twice over many many years simply would be the fact that people probably wherever these were being sold hardware stores that type of thing uh for their price people were probably saying no i'll just get the home utility one i don't need the better version and people who wanted a nice drill probably just said, you know, I'm just going to get the professional or I'm just going to get the heavy duty version. And not a lot of people went for this, but it's just so interesting how the motor is kind of like the home utility version, but it's a 3.5 amp helical cut primary gear set of straight, some needle bearings and this whole, you know, crazy cast aluminum internal frame. That makes it a bear to service because you got to take, literally take the whole thing apart in the, a bunch of pieces just to change the brushes. But nonetheless, it's just the interesting that uh, is a specifically target engineered tool to be right between, once again, right in between the lowest grade and the professional heavy duty stuff. And for the engineering time that went into this, you know, they probably made their money just because Black & Decker sell, you know, back in this era. They were still king of quarter drills, the only competition they really had. They're all the Porter Cables and all the other brands. None of them would have even come close to the numbers that Black & Decker was doing. Milwaukee would have easily been like second place. So they probably made their money back off of the, the time engineering this, but still. Just an odd drill and one that isn't very common just because... They probably just didn't sell very many of them, obviously, because uh, I just don't run into them very much. And more than likely, the expense of this drill meant most people either went with the home utility or the basic version or went with the heavy-duty ones, and those just happened to show up less because less sales. Uh, kind of like this, this semi-professional-grade drill. Real interesting. I do like finding one of these Black & Deckers that does have just kind of looks like innocuous, normal logos but the fact that it's actually really much nicer helical cut gears and three needle bearings kind of cool and this whole weird cast aluminum frame anyway really appreciate everybody who's been watching see you next time